How to Retire with Enough Money and How to Know What Enough is B. Teresa Gallarducci, Ph.D. Facing the Facts Many people are fearful about being able to afford retirement. Even those with pensions, paid for houses and social security benefits are apprehensive. Though individual responsibility is an integral part of retirement planning, the problem of not having enough money goes beyond personal accountability. Most future retirees face an economic climate hostile to their situation. More Americans will have to turn to a part-time, non-career track job to make ends meet in retirement. For decades, Americans depended on traditional pension plans that guaranteed specific retirement payouts. Employees contributed an exact dollar amount from each paycheck. In some cases, employers funded the entire amount, and their companies placed the money in a professionally managed fund. Having pension fund payouts plus social security benefits enabled many people to live comfortably in retirement with a minimum of stress. We've been convinced that the jam we're in is our own fault. But it's not. This isn't just a personal problem, it's a national problem. Though this provision originally was intended to cover the unique demands of highly paid executives who wanted to avoid paying taxes on deferred income, companies tried selling the concept to every employee. The idea of a 401k fund, employers told their workforce, was that if you put aside 3% to 6% of your income, your employer would, in many instances, match your contributions. You wouldn't pay any taxes until you withdrew funds upon retirement. From the moment we wake up in the morning until we go to bed at night, we're part of a huge machine designed to separate us from our money. This sounded good in theory. But unlike a traditional pension with a specific payout, the value of a 401k depends on how much the employee contributes, how much the employer matches, how that money is invested and how well those investments perform. A 401k does not necessarily provide lifelong benefits, its payouts end when you use up the account. Corporations benefited most from the 401k. It relieved them of the responsibility of providing pension payments to employees. If you're like most people, in retirement you'll need 70 to 80 percent of your pre-tax, pre-retirement income. The individual retirement account, IRA, came into vogue around the same time as the 401k. With 401k plans, Employees' investment options could not exceed the menu their employers offered from families of mutual stock and bond funds. But IRAs gave employees the opportunity to invest in almost anything they chose. Ideally, employees would fund their IRA and 401k accounts sufficiently, choose relatively safe investments and resist the urge to withdraw the money before retirement. But average people, through no fault of their own, generally lack investment savvy. Despite holding an IRA or a 401k or both, many people end up retiring without enough money in either account to cover their needs. If you're worried, that's a positive sign. It means you haven't retreated into denial and magical thinking. Most Americans find it scary and difficult to accept the fact that they are not prepared for retirement. The typical middle-class person believes that in retirement, health care will cost roughly $47,000, when the actual amount is around $250,000. People use rationalization and denial to make themselves feel better about this situation, but the only way to fix the problem is to take remedial action as soon as you can. Bringing your picture into focus. How much money will you need to preserve your pre-retirement standard of living? The answer is from 70 to 80% of your pre-tax, pre-retirement income. For example, an individual earning $100,000 annually will require a minimum of $70,000 a year. You'll have fewer expenses in retirement, though the 70% objective accounts for having a paid-off mortgage by retirement. In 2014, 35% of older Americans were still carrying a mortgage. The shift to 401k plans was spearheaded by big business, which was more than happy to relinquish responsibility for sending its retirees a fixed pension check every month. Scale back your lifestyle now, particularly if you won't receive a pension or don't have a retirement account. In that case, you likely will have only roughly 40% to 50% of the yearly income you generated while working. For workers earning less than $40,000 annually, Social Security will replace roughly 90% of your income. If you don't have a pension or sufficient savings, you may have to find a part-time job in retirement. There's no single magic bullet. 
Saving is a combination of many small efforts. A critical factor in retirement planning is figuring out when you will have to stop working and what your life expectancy will be. Three primary factors affecting life expectancy are whether you smoke, whether you are overweight and what your genetic inheritance suggests. If you have healthy genes and don't smoke, chances are you'll reach your late 80s or beyond. Working. Unless you've saved for retirement, consider delaying when you start drawing your social security payments. You can start receiving benefits as early as age 62, but you'll receive the maximum benefit at 70. Most people should wait as long as possible, unless you have a shorter life expectancy and no dependents. Remember, Social Security is insurance, not a retirement plan in itself. To illustrate, a bus driver making $50,000 a year considers retiring at 62 and taking Social Security. He will receive $1,131 a month, far less than the $1,587 he'll receive at 67, which the government designates as normal retirement age, or the $1,984 he'll receive at age 70. Staying on the job. Is your job physically or psychologically challenging? Will changes in your health as you age make you unable to do that job? Does your company require you to pass a yearly physical? Does your employer expect you to retire at a specific age? Are layoffs a possibility? The debate over Social Security is upside down. We need to make Social Security much more generous. And that's completely possible. People face formidable obstacles if they are older than 65 and want and need to work. Your company may want to replace you with a younger, more affordable employee. Your firm may reduce its workforce or positions. You may have to compete against young, tech-savvy candidates who require less expensive health benefits. You may have to take a job at minimum wage in an environment where many employers avoid older workers. Social Security is worth about $300,000 for the average household. Equally important, its benefits are guaranteed. To bolster your chances of continuing employment, take the following steps. 1. Stay up to date on technological advances. Desk jobs requiring computer know-how may be your only option if you have physical issues. 2. Be receptive to mid-career education. The work world changes constantly. 2. Stay ahead of the curve. 3. Stay connected to others. Networking will help you find work. 3. Reach out to a friend or acquaintance. 4. Hope for the best, but be realistic. Employers in fields such as finance, insurance, manufacturing and entertainment look for younger employees. 4. Consider work in a totally new or different field. 4. Don't let your pride stand in the way. Saving, spending and debt. Many people hold questionable ideas about how they will compensate for the gap between the money they have and what they'll need for retirement. Avoid these options. 1. Moving in with your kids. Your children probably won't have the room or wherewithal to help you. 1. Parents and adult children living together is a bad combination. 2. Moving for lower taxes. This strategy makes sense for a business, but not for retirees. 3. Becoming an active investor. Reading financial publications to gain knowledge seems logical, but overly confident investors trade actively and react to the latest news. 3. Trading fees eat their profits, and trying to profit in the short term on a hot stock seldom works. If you didn't inherit bad genes and you don't smoke, it's likely that you'll live into your late 80s. Take these practical steps. 1. Lower your standard of living, live on 70% of your income now. 1. Reduce expenses and spending. 2. Watch what you're doing, stick to your budget and keep track of your purchases. 2. You can save 15% by knowing how you spend. 2. Don't carry balances on your credit cards. 2. Use debit cards that act as credit cards. 3. Raise your deductibles. You'll pay roughly 25% less on homeowner's insurance if you raise your deductible from $500 to $1,000. 4. Don't bother with appliance protection policies. 5. If an appliance breaks during the first year you own it, you're likely to have coverage through the free warranty that came with the purchase. 6. No new cars. 
most new automobiles lose 40% of their value in the first year. 7. A quality used car makes more sense. 7. Avoid extended warranties. 8. Get a short-term mortgage. If you qualify for a 7 or 15-year mortgage, you will face higher monthly payments, but you'll save years of paying interest. 9. If you get a windfall, consider paying off your mortgage or settling any other debt. Investing and allocation. Enlisting the services of a financial advisor or manager isn't inherently a bad idea. The problem is that many people are misinformed and don't ask the right questions. Most advisors work on commissions and will steer you toward investments that will make money for them, but may not be in your best interest. Certified financial planners, on the other hand, charge a flat fee. They are not trying to sell you products or make commissions. If you live to the age of 80, you'll spend as much time being a senior citizen as you did being a child. You may be able to handle your own investments if you understand passive and active fund management. With the former, you invest in a stock index, such as the Russell 3000 or S&P 500. Such indexes contain stock in many of the largest and best-known companies. Though stock market performance fluctuates, in the long run you will benefit. With active management, you look for stocks that will outperform the market. Succeeding in the short term is possible, but statistics indicate that over the years, index funds offer higher returns. An early death shouldn't be anyone's first line of defense against poverty. But for too many people, it is. You'll pay around 2% in fees in an actively managed fund compared with 0.1% in a passively managed fund. To illustrate, a $100,000 investment with a 5% annual return will give you $163,000 in 10 years. With an index fund, you'll pay $2,000 in fees, giving you $161,000. With an actively managed fund, you'll pay a whopping $29,000 in fees and wind up with $134,000. Conventional wisdom suggests that younger people can afford to invest more in stocks than older people who are looking for safer investments, such as bonds. But that's not necessarily true. Every person's situation is unique. One solid tactic is to allocate funds to both indexed stocks and indexed bonds. For instance, you could follow the Barclays U.S. Aggregate Bond Index. Start with a 50-50 allocation and make appropriate adjustments according to your age, life expectancy, marital status, and the like. Unless you're near retirement and financially comfortable, lean toward stocks, since they return more over time and, depending on your age, you may be able to ride out market fluctuations. The key is to not react emotionally when the market is down. Don't sell underperforming stocks in hopes of finding winners. Relax, and eventually the market will rebound. Voting and civic involvement. Social Security and Medicare are even more valuable than most people realize. Economists at the Urban Institute estimate that a single man with an average lifetime income of roughly $44,000 will receive $536,000 in Social Security and Medicare benefits when he retires in 2020. A median income married couple can expect to receive around $1 million. Social Security is a solid program that has enough money to pay all benefits until 2031 without any change in current policy. Policymakers have a variety of simple methods they could apply to improve the system. Many Americans who prematurely withdrew money from their IRAs and 401k accounts rely heavily on Social Security in retirement. Yet Social Security accounts for only 37% of income, for average citizens older than 65. In fact, because retirement savings in the U.S. are generally inadequate, Social Security should expand and provide even more support. Your active involvement in Social Security politics and activism can help lawmakers move forward. Take aways. 1. Social Security will replace only about 40% of most Americans' income. 2. Roughly 50% of all Americans age 50 or older have saved less than $30,000 for retirement. 30% have saved nothing. 3. For the typical middle-class retiree, health care will cost roughly $250,000. 4. Most retired people will need 70% to 80% of their pre-tax, pre-retirement income. 5. Three factors determine life expectancy 
your genes, and whether you're overweight or smoke. 6. Though you can choose to receive social security benefits at age 62, in most cases it's better to wait as long as you can. 7. Learn to live on less now. 7. Don't wait until you're retired. 8. Divide your investments between indexed stocks and indexed bonds. 9. Steer clear of financial managers who work on commission. Quite often their advice is self-serving. 10. Without making any policy changes, Social Security will meet all benefit requirements through 2031. Please like, share and subscribe for more videos. Thanks for watching.